Hi everyone, I'm Gordon Half, and I work in emerging technology at Red Hat and... I'm William Henry and I'm working in the uh, ecosystems engineering at Red Hat. So what we're going to take you through today is several relatively newish initiatives, uh, concepts, uh, sort of sets of technologies and practices that we're putting together that are sort of collectively around making it easier to consume open source software. Um, and this is our agenda, I'm going to sort of set things up a little bit and then I'm going to talk about those initiatives and then going to leave you with a few kind of takeaways about if this piques your interest, things you might like to try out. So, to quote somebody I probably quote way too often, uh, Stephen O'Grady, back in 2012, he wrote this sub uh, blog post. It basically said, do not underestimate the power of convenience. And one of Stephen's arguments, which uh, I think I disagreed with at the time, but as usual, Stephen is right and I'm wrong, was he was arguing that Napster, for example, wasn't so much about getting free music, but it was because you didn't have to go to the record store. And I think the, the popularity of streaming, and I thought he was wrong, uh, but the popularity of streaming, I think, argues he was right. Now, he was arguing here really about open source versus proprietary software. So you won't try out open source, you download it, and it's easy peasy, versus you have to call a sales rep. And between us, no one likes to call sales reps. Um, but the interesting thing is, though, is I think you carry this forward, and the same kind of logic applies to installing and operating open source software versus running a cloud service of some sort, a cloud native service, a software as a service. And in fact, Stephen recently, very recently, wrote another blog post basically about integration versus best of breed. And I think that plays in here as well. And I think there's this, this sort of central tension here. And I, I will describe it as a tension. I actually have a graphic I really like here with the cloud punching out with this hippie looking guy as the cloud versus open source. But I think that actually overstates it. I, I don't think in general we should look at this as a conflict, but rather different ways in a continuum of doing things. So run where you want, you operate it. You can freely modify it. You have, you know, how many desktop managers are there for Linux? Um, it's portable. You can run it in different places. It's open source, but it tends to be less convenient. There's more work involved here in, for instance, freely modifying. Whereas at the other end, you run in a cloud. The cloud takes care of all the uh, services for you. Uh, but you have to, you know, this is the service that Amazon offers. No, they're not going to tweak it for you. Uh, you're going to run what they have. They, they decide what types of services you should have or what you really need. Um, they often are specific to a particular cloud. So while there are commonalities, particularly if you talk about just compute instances among clouds, uh, you start talking to uh, AWS or Google or Azure specific services and they're fairly specific. And although they may be built on open source, the services themselves are often not open source. And, you know, sort of simplify this, uh, every, you know, even more. You have know, this freedom to tinker with your software and you can kind of do anything you want it. But sometimes people just want to get in the car and go places. They won't use the car as essentially a utility at the end of the day. So I'm going to start first talking about um, something called Operate First. Uh, William's going to then come in and describe some solution blueprints, which is a project that he's been very involved with. And then I'm going to close this out talking about cloud services. Now, the, the basic concept here with uh, Operate First is, you know, before open source, 
you know, the code had all this proprietary value associated with it. Um, the, the, the value of the software was in many cases sort of in its proprietariness. There was this artificial scarcity effectively created by uh, licensed software that, you know, yes, it's essentially free to reproduce, but you have to pay for it anyway. And I think arguing, arguably, open source uh, leveled the scale. And I should probably interject at this point and say I borrowed these slides, an example of open source collaboration, from my colleague Karsten Wade, who is actually very involved in setting up uh, the community, some, some of the community related things related to Operate First. This is still fairly early days. Uh, but I'm going to show you some concrete things that we've achieved so far with it. But this is definitely going to be an area to keep your eyes tuned on. And the idea here is you, you know, is you leveled the scale because if everyone has access to the code, having access to the code isn't the differentiator. It's what you do with that access. And what we've seen now in sort of the cloud computing market, and I'm, I'm using this term broadly, we could be talking about hyperscalers, we could be talking about software as a service, we could be talking about other types of outsourcing operations, including more traditional managed services. But it's the operation of the code that becomes more valuable. If you know, anybody can um, you know, install some, you know, kind of name your database, name your uh, AIML type of service. You know, anybody can do that. But what gives Amazon or, AW, or Amazon or Google or Microsoft or other, or, you know, arguably even someone like Salesforce, really what gives them their competitive advantage is that they can operate that stuff at scale really, really well, and uh, certainly better than many particular, particularly smaller to medium enterprises can do so. So if this ops is tilting things in favor of a cloud provider, what do we do to maybe le you know, level things back again? And this brings us to operate first. And you know, we were actually talking last night. We're, we're still working on the language of a lot of this stuff. So when I say to operate first as a concept, that doesn't mean we haven't actually done anything real. But we're, we're trying to think of it as sort of what we're conceptually trying to accomplish at this point. And Karsten, who just walked in and is looking lost, is uh, our community architect who is working in this. So he's, he's going to keep me. Uh, so if he starts like waving his hands and like this, I'll, uh, uh, I'll maybe ask him to say something. But the idea here is ideally, you know, we, we've been, we create software, and certainly we all have uh, quality assurance and various other types of testing. But historically, this has been, let's find the bugs. It hasn't, and it tends to happen at a level that is a long way down from what some of our bigger customers are doing. So the idea here with Operate First is let's try and think about putting operational experience and really operational excellence into software development for the start. And that's by extending development to include all this other operational stuff in a production environment. And production is another one of those words that's kind of a bit funny. And uh, we've argued a little bit about what that means. But I think, again, conceptually, I think we can think of it. It means there's lots of stuff connected together in complicated ways to the degree that you can kind of bring out unpredictable uh, actions potentially in software. And it works by bringing code to a production cloud. They're working with the cloud operators, the SREs, basically, of that production cloud. 
Um, and they experience firsthand the operational considerations. So, you know, certainly DevOps, DevSecOps is one step towards kind of bringing some of that operational knowledge back, you know, kind of back into a developer. But this is really the idea of doing this at production so that developers can start thinking really very far back in the process over, oh, these are some of the scale considerations. I've never been exposed to that directly. And you know, if you're you know, presumably a developer at Google or somewhere like that, you, that may be sort of natural knowledge or firsthand knowledge, but it often isn't with more traditional software development. Now, I'm not going to even try and explain all the organizations involved here. We basically, I, I'm from Massachusetts, um, and basically, um, we've been very involved with uh, something called Mass Open Cloud, which is um, it's a consortium of universities and other kind of research institutions in order to. Uh, kind of set up these, again, production level research um, environments. And it's tied in with the Open Infrastructure Foundation, which is actually you know, hosting some of this stuff. There's the Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center out in Holyoke. Um, Red has been involved in this. We're also directly involved with a number of participating universities, uh, Boston University. We really kind of kicked off this effort. And um, uh, Tufts is another one we've been working on, and telemetry. So there's a bunch of intersecting people here, which I won't attempt to decode. But the, the, the sort of the message here is this is not kind of a red hat thing that we're doing by ourselves. It's something that we've got a lot of different, um, both commercial Intel's in there. IBM has also donated some power hardware, I believe, to some of these efforts. Um, they're all kind of working together and this really kind of widely recognized problem. You know, as I say, this isn't just a concept at this point. So at this zero cluster for operate first, They'd reinstall, ran into some issues. Um, they were able to debug with the ops team and the projects that were operating first. They resolved this problem within a day, and there were some there were some failures, including with the Kubernetes Advanced Cluster Manager, and got some workarounds put in place, and obviously fed changes that needed to be made back into the upstream because that's how we do development. And the ACM team basically noted that if this had happened at a customer site after the software had already gone out the door, this was going to be like a total bear to fix because we wouldn't have been easily able to replicate the customer site. So this is the kind of thing we're hoping to solve with Operate First. So with that, um, that's kind of Operate First. This is a fairly early stage project, uh, and as I say, Karsten is our community manager, and we will have some uh, we will have some links later on. But if you see something here that sounds really interesting, make sure you grab Karsten and talk to him. So with that, William, off to you. Thank you, Gordon. Um, so one of the things that we've been working on internally within Red Hat Engineering is to try to figure out how to make this problem sort of easier for customers, right? Just some terminology here. Gordon mentioned blueprints, solution architectures is up on the slide. There is a lot of terminology going on around this problem. I'll try to explain it in, uh, in terms that uh, make sense, but at, at, within Red Hat, everybody and their cousin wants to have a solution architecture or a blueprint. Everybody knows what has different interpretations of what that is. Um, we're going to be announcing an, an initiative uh, in a couple of weeks at KubeCon, which will have a, a, a name around it um, that might have the term patterns in there. But uh, these are all, uh, from my perspective, these are what you're going to hear today, these are all 
interchangeable at the moment, but patterns is what we're looking at. So what we've been trying to figure out is these architectures are really, really hard, right? We know this from, from, from a long time ago, but uh, the cloud native environment as well, right? We're all moving towards sort of cloud native, DevOps, um, GitOps, all that good stuff, right? Um, the landscape, you often see the, the cloud native landscape a picture with all the different projects in there. But even without that, if you look at a specific deployment of an advanced architecture for an enterprise system, it's very, very, very complex. It's huge. How many people here have experienced that? Okay. By the way, for those of you on the stream, thousands of hands went up right there. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay. So actually one, but that was good. Uh, anyway, the point is, is that uh, when I look at it, like, uh, you know, they call me a senior distinguished engineer or whatever. When I look at this stuff, it's really hard. There's a lot of layers. Gordon talked about ACM there, advanced cluster management. We talk about uh, things like uh, Argo CD, what we call uh, OpenShift GitOps. We talk about pipelines, things like Tekton. We're talking about Open Data Hub, which uh, allows you to do uh, for data scientists to do machine learning in the background, which again is a very on its own a complex uh, uh, project. And then all of the other pieces like messaging and data lakes and uh, making sure you have connections out into GitOps and re image registries. They're very very complex problems, right? Um, we don't want people to try to reinvent this all over again. If we're going to try to solve this operate first problem, we want to be able to try and at least deploy things in a very predictable uh, and automated way. We see these patterns emerging, right? So when we're out there with customers, we go, this is a very interesting pattern. It's something that maybe we should be able to take inside at Red Hat and try to replicate and see if we can turn around and uh, first of all, tell our consultants and others in the field, hey, this worked at customer XYZ Go and try to implement this at other customers as well. Learn from what they've done. Okay, so one of the, how do we do that? Uh, well, we find these successfully deployed uh, complex solutions that we've, we've discovered at a customer. We do not want William Henry in engineering to be dreaming this stuff up. We went down this road many times at Red Hat with what we call reference architectures. Right, where an engineer goes, if I were deploying this, this is how I would deploy it. Turns out perhaps that it might be a clever way of doing it, but customers are usually right and they will inevitably deploy things a different way than what we would do. So let's take something that's out there and that's not just a single product, it's multiple products, and let's document the architecture. Let's review it with a lot of peers internally, engineers, what we call communities of practice, uh, a lot of our solution architects, senior solution architects and consultants in the field. Um, and then we want to turn around and take the code that they've developed. And, not, and this isn't just uh, application code. This is all of the configuration code, um, how to tie things together, all that y y lovely cloud native YAML that you all love. Um, and move that into a framework that is repeatable for doing DevOps and GitOps. And then we want to publish it as open source and say, hey, if you want a data center to do AIML, here's the entire blueprint, pattern, whatever you want to call it. And it's more than that, though. We're going to actually do a little bit more than that. What we're going to do, so on the left-hand side here, you're seeing that whole kind of front-end gathering information piece, um, validating piece, publishing it out to the world, not the code, to say, hey, this is a, a, a wonderful architecture you might want to look at it, but of some of those architectures that we want to invest in because we see a lot of them in the field, very repeatable, we want to take some of those and um, automate them, uh, move them into a, uh, a Git repository where we're continuously testing them. So one of the downstreams from this um, patterns, from these patterns, are quality engineering. So we're going to be at Red Hat running QE on these patterns continually to make sure that uh, a pr an upgrade, for example, in Kafka isn't going to break uh, multiple manufacturing sites around the world, right? 
we want to make sure that that can happen. We want to be able to look at these things in a much more holistic approach rather than single product problems or single product failures. What happens to this architecture as products upgrade, as things change? The other part of it is going to be, we have at Red Hat a, a system called RHPDS, which is our sort of demo environment for people. Labs, if you go to Red Hat, uh, if you go to Summit or uh, other places that do Red Hat Labs, it runs on that environment as well. So you'll have you know, 50 people or 20 people in a class all logged in, doing examples of code and working on it. That's all in RHPDS. And of course, the other downstream then is the community itself, uh, people who, are, um, who we want to get involved in these particular patterns, uh, contributing code to them. Uh, updating them to us. Maybe there's a pattern uh, that has a, uh, a specific open source project, but a third party partner says, hey, we want to actually show you what that pattern would look like with our open source project in there. Maybe it's a security project for doing um, examination of images and looking at registries and see if there's any uh, failures or problems within certain images. Uh, but also customers and partners. We want uh, people in the consulting world to be able to turn around and go, well, gosh, why would we reinvent this now? Not only are there open source projects, uh, products, but there are also these, these patterns that Red Hat and the community are developing that we can turn around and take and deploy and modify as uh, fits our customer, right? So they're like going to be great starting points. Here's a type of one we've, we're working on. I, I don't want you get too much into details of this, but you can see this is very complex. We're talking about on the, on the this is a, a, what we call an edge use case. Um, I'll talk to, to, to this slide. I don't want to get too much detail about it, but you can look it up later. Um, is this the, it is. Um, on the data center side, so we have a data center. Uh, let's say this data center is a factory, uh, sorry, is a large sort of main factory in Germany for a car manufacturer, something like that. But they have other factories all over Germany or other parts of the world, and they need to turn around and do anomaly detection on uh, various machinery that's going on on the factory floor, right? And so on, the, on the, the problem you have here is on the data center side, you want to have data science to be able to do machine learning. So you have data scientists using uh, things like Open Data Hub, et cetera. You're gonna, but you're going to have to have pipelines for them to do DevOps, right? So that's things like Tekton. Um, you're going to want to get data back from the factories to do more machine learning later. So you're going to have distributed streaming services. Um, you're also going to want image registries for pushing things out, source code repositories. You're going to want a GitOps controller to watch what's happening on Git and trigger events to start off both uh, you know, image building, et cetera. And then um, you're going to want to have smart factory management, in other words, for uh, advanced cluster management, where you're looking at how many factories are coming on. How, how do we know when a particular factory comes up what to deploy on that particular factory? And of course, on the factory side, you're going to have your applications, various messaging and integration pieces to your uh, machinery in the factory, the, what they call the line servers and stuff like that. You're going to want shared storage. The green aspects there are kind of like, <laughs> funny enough, the user code. Not an awful lot of user code here, an awful lot of uh, other pieces, uh, things like messaging brokers and, again, um, distributed streaming and MQTT, et cetera. Very, very complex, right? Now, watch what happens when you actually try to deploy this. That's a logical diagram. This is just one view of that particular thing from a, this is the physical architecture for the DevOps piece, I believe. Um, but there's also a GitOps part of this too. So when, this is for when the uh, data scientists do their updates to this. And you, as you can see, various different networks. Um, we want to segment off different pieces of this for security, et cetera. Uh, so different networks, different cardinality of things that are supposed to be highly available. Um, and of course, you have the message flows that we're detailing between them. So what we try to do is document the architectures in these diagrams. So we all have the same semantics when we're talking uh, to each other about these uh, deployments and what they look like in the patterns. 
Um, but that's, and, and that's more of the, um, hey, here's an architecture that works. Go out and talk to more customers about it. Then we take a, the code that's involved in that and we want to bring that in and automate it and let people use it and try to make it as simple as possible to deploy. We have it down now to like a uh, update a file with some of your details, your keys and stuff like that, and then do, I'll show you in a moment, and then do a, a make build, but we're even going to modify it more. The idea then is we get happy architects, right? They go out, what I would like to see is architects coming into something like the OpenShift um, user interface and saying, okay, you know, I'm looking at my environments, I'm looking at my current architecture. What, what, is, what does Red ha have for these patterns? Let me have a look. Oh, here's a manufacturing pattern that's doing AIML. I wonder what that would look like. And being able to turn around and essentially push a button and deploy that out into an OpenShift cluster really, really easily, right? It, it would just do it for you, right? Um, then you could turn around and look at it and say, okay, now that application is anomaly detection for a, um, for a, a manufacturing business. What if we wanted to do this for a health facility where we're doing um, detection of pneumonia? Well, we're doing an example around that as well. We'll be codifying that in the next month, month or so. Um, an example that was happening at the, at the uh, VA and they were doing pneumonia detection. And it turns out the data center looks kind of the same, but what happens out on the medical facility is different to what's going on in the factory. Obviously, we're talking about uh, not just data coming from uh, machines, but we're talking about images coming from uh, x-ray machines, right? So there's a lot of file-based stuff going on there. But then you turn around, you can, so you can tailor it to make your mean, oh, okay, we're not doing pneumonia detection, but we're doing, um, we're doing uh, let's say, TB detection. Okay, so it's going to be a slightly different algorithms or whatever, but it mostly it's the same thing. Oh, we're not going to use S3 as a storage. We're going to use something else. But you can tailor it slightly to what you want, and then you can push that back into your GitOps environment, and now you have a working. By the way, when we talk about deployment, we're not just talking about deployment once. We have full day two operations where you are able to turn around and modify the code, um, and it will continually update, right? So how do we do that? You'll go out to the repository and you'll find this pattern um, that you want out in the pattern repo. You, you can fork that yourself and say, okay, this is my particular fork of this, my company's fork of this. And then, um, you know, as a developer or an architect, you do a local clone. You can go in and change a few secrets in there. Like, hey, here's my GitHub information. Here's my Quay or key registry information, other, other secret stuff like that. Obviously, you're not going to push that back up to your repo. That uh, stays on your on your laptop, and then you can simply press, you know, run make deploy or press a button, and off it goes. And what happens is, it will take some very very complex pieces that you as a developer or an application provider don't care about. It's like I don't really. I'm not in the business, uh, and this gets back to the operate first stuff that that Gordon was talking about. I'm not in the business of managing all this stuff, GitOps and pipelines and messaging brokers and all that. Let this do all of that. I do want visibility into it. I need to know what's going on in there. My developers want to know, but at least get this thing up and going. What, what's going to drive that? OpenShift GitOps, which is Argo CD project, and it's going to turn around and deploy different applications, which turns around and brings up different app, uh, operators. Um, like uh, the AMQ operator or the, in this case, even the advanced cluster management operator. So we're driving advanced cluster management from our OpenShift GitOps so that we're using OpenShift GitOps as a consistent way of deploying everything out onto a cluster. Um, and then, of course, all the other pieces of applications like, oh, we need the pipelines, I need the data lake set up, I need all these other pieces. So one way of looking at that, a lot of people, when you go into something like a, a Kubernetes environment, you start looking at pods and things like that, right? Or in OpenShift, you might look at the operators and all that, what are installed, et cetera. But when you're an application developer, you're really kind of looking at, oh, I thought we had hidden that, but there you go. This is actually what happens in the same environment when you have that edge, whether it's the medical facility or whether it's the factory, you can simply turn around and import the cluster in and what that does is uh, advanced cluster manager, advanced cluster management turns around and says, oh, okay, you, 
You want to be registered here as a factory? Great. Uh, it installs an ACM agent out there. The ACM agent says, oh, well, my, one of my first things to do is I'm going to get you up on uh, with OpenShift GitOps, Argo CD. And as soon as that happens, it says, hey, what, what is this? Where am I? Oh, I'm in a factory. Oh, if I'm in a factory, these are the applications I download. So downloads the applications which are to do with the anomaly detection, the notification service, those things you saw earlier. But part of it too will be turning around and saying um, uh, things like, hold on, GitOps applications. Uh, it will also be installing certain operators too for things like MQTT, CamelK, um, and uh, OpenShift, or sorry, AMQ streams, which are all part of that manufacturing site. So literally, three things that you would have to do in this edge use case. One is change your secrets, deploy the data center, and register your edge cluster, and you're done. It deploys the whole thing for you. It's pretty cool stuff. I have a question here. Are we doing questions now? Sure. Yeah, let's do a. Yes, absolutely. Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. You're asking, uh, at any time, can I query and see what am I running? Is that correct? Yeah, there are, there are a couple of different ways of doing that. One is you can look at it from inside of the OpenShift environment, right? So you can turn around and say, what's actually running in OpenShift right now? What operators are running? What pods are in there? And you can, uh, there's lots of different ways within OpenShift or Kubernetes to say, hey, show me the manifest of everything that's running right now and all that good stuff. The other way of looking at it is from within um, something, again, this is a picture you probably can't see down there, but within Argo CD, it's a different way of looking at it, saying, hey, let me see this from an application perspective. Right now, when you drill down, so for example, there's the Manila ACM. Uh, with the Manila is the project that we call this. So Manila ACM, literally all that's going on in there is, is ACM, is Advanced Cluster Manager up. However, here in Manila Test All application, that has a whole bunch of things about staging and development to do all sorts of tests. And within that, you can see a complete graph of everything that is working or not working or synced or not synced within your environment. So it depends on how you're coming into it. You can, sometimes you go in here first to see, is everything running? Yes, now let me go into OpenShift and see what the manifest says and what's, run, what's happening there. Contemplating us to be able to configure the widget export an SQL as well. Are you contemplating adding the features rather than going out and you know, looking at the graphically? Can we look at basically? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you could absolutely do that, without a doubt. And you could go into the, uh, you know, again, you're going, everything here is in Git. Yeah. So everything, the code and all of the operators, all the YAML, yeah. everything is in Git. So you can go in there and modify that. And once you do a, a push to Git, it will turn around and Argo CD will see the change and go, oh, what does yeah. this mean? Yeah. I need to synchronize things. Yeah, again. so I mean, the question is sort of, you know, software bill of materials. Going, I think what is fair to say is all the tools are there to do it. They are probably not as well integrated at this point, you know, where it's like, you know, press the easy button and get your software bill of materials. But those are the kind of things that are being worked on yeah. here. Yeah, well, at the same time, though, you can turn around and say, hey, within this namespace on my cluster, tell me everything that's in it and get a full manifest. That's like, in fact, that's how we help debug this stuff. We turn around always and say, okay, what's running right now? And we go through it and go, oh, that's why, that's what's causing our issue. So yes, we're already doing that today. But in, in fairness, to your point, one of the things we're discovering is for troubleshooting this ourselves, and walking through that sort of tree of, of, of finding where things are, uh, we're, we're gonna have to do a better job of documenting that. Right now though, the manifest, these visual tools, et cetera, are the things that we, we find the most useful part of it. So, um, Again, within I, thought this I, was I, I think well. we're accidentally going through our uh, hidden slides. Our hidden because slides. Of the mode we're so in. again, this is the sort of <laughs> OpenShift's view of that. Yeah. So, just in summary, where you can find information on this today. Again, this is very very new, um, but uh, hybridcloudpatterns.io 
and that's with that's hyphenated hybrid hyphen cloud hyphen patterns.io and github uh, up there is the hybrid cloud patterns um, link as well the project there and we've segmented it out into like common areas documentation and also then these particular patterns for manufacturing or for we're going to be doing the medical diagnosis we might be doing some smart cities uh, examples as well and so the idea is you can go in there see the entire uh, most of these cases involve multiple data multiple clusters so we're talking like data center plus a lot of edge cluster as well um, and so you'll be able to just go in and see these things and of course they're also consuming from a kind of a common area as well so we don't have to like rewrite the the YAML for all of the say AMQ or AMQ streams as well any more questions on this before I go on? Because it's, uh, but it, it gets back to what, what Gordon was saying earlier, the operate first kind of example, where how are we doing time? Good. Yeah. yeah. So it gets back to his operate first uh, uh, issue, uh, what he was talking about earlier is we want to try to make deploying these very complex things simple and also have a pattern that's recognizable and reusable over and over again. So that even if, you're, if the complexity is different from one deployment to another, how to get it in there and get it deployed in a consistent manner and a supportable manner is, uh, is simple, or at least uh, intuitive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so sort of to finish this off, let's talk about cloud services. So this has all been great. These are ways to simplify complex deployments, but you're going to have some organizations that say, I don't want to hire a bunch of SREs. Um, you know, I don't want to operate a lot of this stuff. Now, it's not that cloud services and cloud native services and public clouds are necessarily simple. Certainly, if anybody has looked at the AWS services page recently with however many forms of Kubernetes and container operations there are there. It's not exactly simple, but still the underlying operation of the infrastructure is something that a, an, or, you know, an enterprise organization doesn't need to do. And so there are a few different scenarios here. So, you know, I guess we'll use it. If it breaks, I want it to be someone else's problem. I don't want to have my engineers being woken up with a page at two in the morning because some underlying service is broken. Now, of course, your application can still break and things can break at that level, but still, the infrastructure takes a lot out. Um, I, you know, you don't want to talk to a sales rep. I, you know, also, I don't want to talk to a sales rep in order to use it. I just want to be op able to open a ticket to use it. I just want to have my credit card in a, in a service and do some clicking on a self-service console. I don't want to have to worry about have the latest patches been installed in the underlying um, you know, operating system or other infrastructure. I don't need to worry about, up, worry about upgrading it. But here's the critical distinction. So, so far, everything I've said is pretty much the case of if I went to, you know, name your favorite hyperscaler or other large cloud provider. The difference is, but what if I want to maintain a choice of cloud providers and an option if I choose to accept it down the road to maybe operate this myself, maybe some portion of my application for whatever regulatory reasons I really want to keep in house but I'm fine with going out to a public cloud for kind of the more pedestrian type of uses. Can I add one thing to that? Sure. So this is really important too because uh, if you look at what I just talked about we're talking about these very very complex architectures but I did mention that a lot of times this is installing things like uh, AMQ operators or AMQ streams operators or the open data hub operator and all that good stuff. And that, that's all good and well, but we're also looking for, from those patterns perspective in the future, how are people going to be using this? And do I want to turn around and swap out the AMQ operator, i.e. installing it 
and doing what Gordon says here and says, I don't want to install it. I don't even want it to be part, I want it to be mentioned in my pattern, but I don't want the pattern actually deploying it. Well, then it can be switched over to a managed service, right, or a cloud service where we say, hey, just get the AMQ that's up in the cloud versus the one that I'm having to install and manage as an operator. So that's another, uh, another aspect of where we're looking with the, the patterns that I talked about uh, for perhaps next year. You'll, you'll see that stuff. Yeah, happening. and this is the basic architecture and you know, don't worry about, don't pay too much attention to all the various logos here, but someone had already made a nice diagram of this for me, so I'm borrowing it. So, you know, Linux underlies a lot of this stuff. Kubernetes is the standard container orchestration layer on top of that. Um, you then have what we call you know, various cluster services associated with, um, with Kubernetes. And then on top of that, and we're just starting to build this out right now, but um, various types of services. So platform services, this, and this is how we've broken it down. Uh, platform services, application services, data services, and developer services. And I'm going to dig in a little bit deeper into the data services because it shows kind of how operate first and solution architectures and cloud services all kind of loosely interrelate with each other. And then on top of this, you have multi-cluster management. Um, you know, one of the ideas here is, and one of the, frankly, challenges as we uh, put together these cloud services is that, frankly, one of the problems with a lot of cloud native services is they're not very streamlined from a usage perspective. And, and the reason is partly organizational and just how a number of the cloud developers have developed their services, namely you have your two pizza team or whatever developing this service, a different two pizza team developing that service. And it actually leads to a lot of innovation because you have these teams that are kind of left at some level to do their own thing as long as they meet whatever their objectives are. But it doesn't necessarily encourage working with other teams to have an overall streamlined experience. One of our goals here is to have a, a much more streamlined developer experience across different uh, kind of different types of cloud services here. Um, so in the, in the case of uh, data specifically, um, the way we kind of think of it is that you get data at rest, data in motion, and then data that you're actually working with, that you're doing some something with. And so those are kind of the specialized data services that um, areas that we are thinking about. And I'll specifically talk about um, primarily the data work, somewhat data pipelines. And then you'll have underlying infrastructure under there. So for example, you know, probably most notably large pools of um, typically, in our case, Ceph-based storage that you're kind of using to load all this data that you need for uh, AI ML modeling and training and so forth. So let me give you an example here. So Open Data Hub is open source. It's essentially a curated, although I know with the size of that diagram, it doesn't look very curated, but there's actually an amazing number of projects happening in this space in terms of uh, AI and, and ML, in terms of the training, in terms of the data analysis, in terms of the metadata management, in terms of the underlying storage, uh, in terms of basically data in motion, streaming and so forth, security and governance kind of overlay on that, monitoring and orchestration uh, overlay on that. So you have data, Open Data Hub, which is you know, essentially this collects of upstream projects. And you know, we, we do work in the upstream in order to integrate that. Now, does this look complex? Yes, it does look kind of complex. And 
I think our, our you know, sort of their original plan was what we typically have historically done at Red Hat, which is, well, we'll we will come out with a pro we will productize this open source project and provide support and provide knowledge and provide blueprints and do all that kind of thing with it. And I'm not saying that is not going to happen at some point, but it right now is an open source uh, project. We stamp we decide to deliver it as a service to start with. Um, so basically, upstream code, and it is the upstream code, this isn't, you know, there isn't proprietary stuff in here, but it's enhanced with operational excellence. So you've got the Open Data Hub upstream. We have a subset of Open Data Hub operate at scale for the community and university audiences, and that's how we're going to get to that operational excellence to infuse into it. Um, as William mentioned, uh, some of the solution architectures are, you know, are kind of going off in the, oh, you all operate it on-prem, uh, the open source project on-prem. Here are some things that, we'll, that we're doing to make it easier to do that. But we assume that you want a curated um, open data hub that you don't want to have SREs, that you don't want to have um, your data engineers necessarily operating a large-scale infrastructure to run that. You just want to, you just want it to run and over time be able to run it in multiple places. Right now, this is uh, on Amazon Web Services, which is where we've historically kind of tended to roll out things first, just because AWS was kind of furthest along when we started rolling out uh, various types of services and various types of offerings and clouds. And so we end up with a cloud service offering called Red Hat OpenShift Data Science that's uh, delivered as a cloud service on our managed uh, Red Hat OpenShift inst uh, instances, which in turn run on AWS, where we're not a DSR operator. Uh, there are companies out there that do that have a lot more expertise in this kind of thing than we do. And th this is, I think that, that, that's nice because it gives you kind of a sense of how you can take things in various directions while not kind of having to make a radical break in order to use, oh, well, you have to run this for all time on this particular cloud service, or you need to use something else, or you have to use an open source project, you have to figure out how to install and operate on your own. And I think this guy shows this idea of choice among all these right. different footprints. Yeah, it's a good, it's a great point too, because again, it goes back to if you, adopt one of these patterns that we were talking about, these solution architectures that use, open, that use Open Data Hub, you can turn around and say, okay, instead of installing it, let me just run it as a, as a, uh, a service. Yeah, and for that matter, you, we might very well have people who like, hey, I won't give this thing, a, before I go a lot of trouble, let me give this thing a try. Right. And uh, okay, that's nice but I want to substitute out these other open source projects and you know, I go to trouble of setting up my own installation. So um, that is it. Uh, these are some links. William already gave you the links for solution architectures. Um, we do have an uh, Operate First Cloud website, which uh, Karsten here is frantically expanding and making more community friendly, but it's a good place to get started. Uh, I'll also give a plug of in the Associated Open Infra Labs, which is our under Open Infra Foundation. There's a telemetry working group, which is obviously very important for all these large, complex, distributed computing things. So again, that's not as well developed as we'd like it to be either, but if telemetry and, and distributed tracing and so forth, the stuff that interests you, by all means, uh, go check that out as well. So with that- um, One more? Oh, do we have one more? Oh, yes. Don't oh. forget. 
To go down, you can get Gordon's book. There's a few copies of my open source book left uh, that will be at our booth tomorrow. And there's also tons of stickers. We have the best swag. stickers. Yeah. We have the best Lots stickers. stickers. If you don't have stickers, you got to come to the, uh, to the booth. Um, and they're also giving away a wireless charging mouse pad. Whatever that is. Okay. And hats. So, and hats. Lots of hats. Yes. So please, yeah, come by the booth if you have any more questions. So thank you all. Th yeah. Um, thank you. We're, we're going to both be heading over to the sponsor showcase from here. So if they, we'll, we'll probably be meandering around the Red Hat booth and so forth. So if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to swing by. Thank you very much.